thank you, Ms. Christie, for that. And then um, many of you might be wondering, where's Daniel and Lydia? Daniel and Lydia actually are in Tennessee. Uh, Daniel's mom graduated from college, and so they were there for the celebration yesterday. They'll be heading back uh, later today. And so if you would pray for their safety as they travel, and we look forward to having them back as well. In your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11, and then also Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis 22. It goes along with this uh, story in Hebrews chapter number 11, and it's a, a great uh, story in the sense of uh, the greatness of it is demonstrating the faith of Abraham to trust God in a very difficult situation. And so as we go through this, I want to give the background, but I also want to give some understanding here because any of, anyone looking at this uh, may have the mindset of what a cruel God to do this to somebody. And I think when you understand what's behind this story, you'll understand more about what God was actually doing in the life of Abraham, but then also a future promise that he was assuring uh, to not only Abraham, but to all of us as well. So Hebrews chapter 11, and it was read earlier in the service by Pastor Mike, and we see in verse number 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise is offered up his only begotten son. When you consider this, and some of you might be saying, am I reading this correctly? Uh, yes, you are reading this correctly. God asked Abraham to offer up his son as a sacrifice. And immediately to someone who is not a person of faith, or even to some of us who are people of faith, when we read that for the first time, you're like, okay, time out here. Really? Am I reading this? God wanted Abraham to offer his own son up as a sacrifice? I mean, would God really do that? And the answer to that is no. But he was testing Abraham. He was putting Abraham to a test. You say, well, that's one of the most cruel tests that you could actually do to a parent, especially with their background in the story. And that would be true if it was just a test of cruelty, but that's not what it was a test of. And so if you permit me, give me allow me to give you some introductory notes, and then we will jump into uh, the, the main idea of what God was trying to express to us the title I've given this message here this morning is Faith Exemplified Through Testing. Faith Exemplified Through Testing. To understand the test that we see in our text today, one must understand the covenant that God had made with Abraham many years earlier. God promised Abraham that he would have a son and that the son would be the heir and progenitor to multitudes of children. God waited to deliver on that promise until the human possibility of having a child was gone from Abraham and even from Sarah. Sarah was past the age of what people would even consider for her to be the ability to bring forth a child as well as Abraham. Abraham being 100, Sarah being 90. And we, yet we see that God showed them that he kept his word by delivering to them a son. Now God gives Abraham another test that absolutely makes no sense to the human mind, but was used to demonstrate two key things, Abraham's true faith and God's future sacrifice of his own son. And if you miss what is being taught here, then you'll look at God as someone who just likes to play around with his creatures, but that is not how you're to look at this story at all. We're looking at God who developed a relationship with Abraham. You've heard me say it, and if you get the book that we suggest you get from our church on the way out, uh, that book called Done, it explains the difference between a relationship and religious practice. And the key that we must understand as humans is that God desires a relationship with you that's real. You can talk to Him just like you talk to your best friend. Matter of fact, he can become the best friend you've ever had. He can become your BFF, okay? You can have a relationship with God as your father, and as it said elsewhere in the scriptures, as Abba, Daddy. Intimately, you can have a relationship with God that way. He desires for you to know him that way. The problem is we set up our own faith roadblocks. We set up our own um, guidelines for how we think God should communicate to us and to the world. We are not God. We must come to the place where we understand that He is sovereign and we come underneath His sovereignty, His rulership. And if we understand this 
story based on what God was demonstrating to Abraham, a man that he has built a relationship with, a man that he had tested prior to this major test, a man that has uh, uh, made some mistakes, sinned, did wrong, and God yet still was in his life, now comes to a major test in his life about this particular uh, issue. According to our text in Hebrews 11, verse number 19, it says, Abraham believed that God had the power to resurrect his son Isaac. It says there in the text, he accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. It's interesting how in the New Testament sheds more light sometimes on Old Testament passages. Hebrews does a great job shedding a light on the whole sacrificial system and the law of Moses that was set up for us. The book of Hebrews is a great book to give us a wonderful commentary on what was God's plan since the beginning of the world. It was to bring about the story of redemption. It was to bring about trust alone in Jesus Christ, the great high priest. So as we're now in chapter 11, and we call it the great hall of faith, if you would, we're looking at characters that God is lifting up in our eyes to say, hey, look what they did by faith. And their faith was not just in this test. Their faith was actually in God before that test. There's no way they would make it through that test unless they had a personal faith in God first and foremost. And so, with that being said, what tests are you facing today? What's going on in your life right now that is a great test for you that God knows everything about? It doesn't surprise Him. Someone once said that every test that you have first comes across the desk of God. And I don't doubt that for a second. God is intimately involved with your life. He understands where you're at, what you need, what you're going through, and what pressure He needs to put on you to conform you to His image. Now listen, there's not one of us, now I don't know about you, some of you how many of you who actually, when you were in school, you liked going to take tests? All right, you're the people that I hated. I think it was only two of you, so sorry. I hated tests. I would sweat when I took tests. I would, my brain would just start doing these numbers where I was just like, some, sometimes a simple test and I would mess it up. I just, I struggled sometimes with tests. It was just the way my brain worked and I did not like tests. But obviously there are some people who like tests. So when we come to spiritual tests, I could ask the same question, and I don't know how many of you would answer, yes, I love when God puts me to the test. Not many of us would be in that group either. No, I don't like when God puts me to the test. They say, you know, Pastor, would you pray for me that God helps me, you know, to be more patient? Uh, you don't want to pray that prayer, and I'm not sure you want me to pray that for you, because for surely, if you want more patience, then God's going to mess up your life <laughs> so you learn patience. Don't pray that prayer. Are we okay, God? <laughs> Say, Pastor, I want God to increase my faith. Oh, time out. You know, really? You sure? But we know we have to go through those things. And it's not a test that's based on something that's new and radical in the sense of all of a sudden surprise. Typically, God is very good about giving you all the details before. Sometimes we miss it. Just like sometimes a teacher gives you a test that, Teacher, that wasn't in my notes. Oh, really, Johnny? Turn back to page number 436. Look at category B down here, a little letter A. Yes, it's in there. Oh, man. But sometimes we, we look at God when he gives us a test like, you didn't give me those notes. You didn't tell me that was coming. And sometimes we're just not aware because we're not in tune with God. Listen, I'm as guilty as the next person. Sometimes I just live my life like everything's going fine. All of a sudden a test comes like, whoa, blindsided. Where did that come from? But if I was in tune with God more, he might have even prepared me for it. And I've had that many times where I just sensed something was coming and I would just spend more time in prayer and God just kind of slowly, I was like, okay, I saw this coming. God slowly showed me that. Sometimes God does it that way. But when we're not in tune with God, we can become blindsided, but I've never seen God purposely blindside us. We're just not in tune 
with him in the classroom, and then the test comes, and we're not ready for the test. And so all the things, since the day that you trusted Christ your Savior, you should be gleaning knowledge about how God interacts with you spiritually. You should be gleaning from God based on the test of your being a witness, the test of how people react when you tell them you're a Christian, the test of, of going through sickness and asking God to, to deliver you from that, the test of financial reversal in God. What did He teach you through that lesson? And it doesn't mean that God's always just going to deliver you, but He's going to give you the grace to go through those tests because of your past experiences He's kind of prepared you along the way. And sometimes the testing God's putting you through is for you to be a witness to someone else. Or is for you to give advice that those people would not have access to unless somebody else who went through that could now teach them and help them. There are tests that different people go through and you need to be praying, God, why? What's going on? What are you trying to teach me? But I guarantee you, if you were in tune with God, He would be in the prep mode in your life, helping you to come to a place where you would respond to testing instead of reacting to testing. What are some of the tests that people face today? Some are tested in their church attendance. Do you realize that Jesus Christ died? Now think about it. If somebody dies for something, how important is it for that person in their mind that if, he, if they choose to die for something, how important do you think it would be that for a person for us to honor that? But how come people today treat church so flippantly? I'll go if I feel like it. If it's not raining, if it's not too sunny, if I don't have a sports event, if I don't have the... We treat God's church that he died for as something that's take it or leave it. How is that? What is that telling God about us? What are we saying to him about his sacrifice? That's just one area. Some are tested in the area of their spiritual gifts. Do you know that when you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, he equipped you with a spiritual gift not to hoard it, not to use... Elsewhere, he says very specifically, your spiritual gift is used to be edify the body of Christ. Well, if I'm a Christian, then I better find out what my spiritual gift is and how does God want me to use that in his local body? But Christians just check out. Well, that's not, you know, I'm exempt from that test. Really? Says who? And we can go on and on, but these are things that we as Christians, we want to be considered a good Christian, but yet we're not willing to do the things that God has just said. This is basic. This is his expectations of us as his followers. Some are tested in their willingness to be a witness. Some are tested in their attitude towards sinful Christians. Some are tested in their personal pet habitual sins. Some are tested in their fear of man. Some are tested in their lack of faith. Some are tested in negative thoughts and communication, gossip, slander, divisive talk, hateful thoughts. We can go on and on and on. There are so many different tests. And if you would start from the time that you trusted Christ throughout your Christian life... How have you done in those different settings? What has God been teaching you? Where are you in your spiritual growth in your walk? What was God doing to ask a man whom he promised to multiply his offspring to tell him to sacrifice his only son? Well, there are several lessons that we can learn from this test. Abraham's unquestionable faith in God's person his plan, his promise, and his future glory were all part of this. God's person, his plan, his promise, and his future glory. All this is a part that we can find in this test of Abraham. Why? Because it involves a promise that God gave to Abraham. Think about this. Abraham at this point in his life, would you say that Abraham at this point in his life, after having Isaac, was a man of great faith? or mediocre faith. I would tell you he's a man of great faith at this point in his life. Now if we look back in his story, could we see at times where he didn't have great faith? I would say yes. There were times where we look back in his life and there was times where we kind of question. He lied twice to two different kings about who his wife was. Right? But then... He found out his nephew Lot was taken captive. He got 300 of his own servants trained in war. So let's go get him. And he goes up again. This is the third king. And that was multitudes of kings. There were several kingdoms that were going at, at battle. He went back. Not only did he get Lot, but he also got the goods for the kingdom. And he made an offering to Melchizedek out of a, of a heart of great gratefulness to God. This guy was 
had great faith in what God was doing. And so you have to understand this as you look at these stories, consider yourself. There have been tests. There might be tests right now in your life. God is building your faith. Now, some of you, he's not building your faith because you're not seeing it that way. You're still kicking and screaming. You're still, teacher, teacher, that wasn't on my notes. What is God preparing you for? Now, I'm not saying that God's going to obviously do something like this in your life. But he's preparing you for other things that are to come. And it might be that the story that you have now and how you've gotten through those things, if you would have went through it with spiritual understanding, you could be such a great testimony to others and encouragement to others in the body of Christ saying, hey, I've been through something similar. Can I, can I just give you some advice or can I just tell you what God did in my life during that time? And that might be a huge help to another Christian who's going through it for the first time. We don't know how God's going to use some of these tests in our life, but if you go through it with the right mindset as Abraham did, it proved that he was a man of great faith. We also see in our text in Hebrews chapter 11, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah were all tested in their faith. But may I say, that wasn't the first test that they faced. This was just one of many tests that proved that they were people of faith. That is why the writer of Hebrews is lifting them up. He's saying, look, the people who live for God by genuine faith, look at what they were able to accomplish. So let me ask you a question, Christian. What are you able to accomplish for God because of your faith? What tests may come down the road? What situations will God put you in? What abilities has God given you that you can help God's work move forward? And to have a person also that God says, hey, have you ever noticed Kyle's faith? You ever noticed Joe's faith? You ever noticed that he can go through the list? Look at their faith. Look what they've been able to accomplish because they were faithful to me. So we must understand if you put yourself in these stories, it really sheds a, a different light. But let me go back to this. Abraham was at a point where he had absolute faith in his God. Not a question. Think about it this way. How many of you have ever put your kids to a test? How many of you have ever put your kids to a little test? Uh, some of you might need a clarification. All right. Say, say you say to one of your children, I want you to go do this that you know is outside of their ability to do. And what does the child do? Go to mom. Mom, do you know what dad asked me to do? And mommy was like, okay, what's up with dad? You know, and now, typically in those situations, prepare mom first so she doesn't go against you, okay? But, you know, just in, just in case. But we recognize that sometimes a child will go to mom to say, dad's being unreasonable. But then mom, thinking, ah, uh, I know what he's doing. He's trying to teach you a lesson. And she doesn't give in on that. She's like, well, then go do it. And under the watchful eye of dad, which I've done a few times with my boys, I've watched them try. And then guess who goes over and helps? I do. I just wanted to see if you were willing to try. You need to look at this story from that perspective. God, a gracious God, a loving God, a God who is trying to prove, that's the idea of testing here, demonstrate in Abraham, I know you say you trust me, but I need you to demonstrate it. So well, doesn't God know everything? Yes. Maybe it's even more so for us then that sometimes people are tested because we look at other humans. Sometimes we look at God and say, well, he's God. But if you can see another human being overcome something because of the faith they have in their God, we could say, Okay, well, that's still amazing, but maybe I could get to that point in my life as well. But in this particular story, let me just fast forward in your minds, he's using this as an illustration of, hey, there is another one who's going to come someday, and it's going to be a similar story, but this one's going to be the real one. And so let me just go now, jump into our main points for this, because I want you to understand what's being set forth here. Testing of Abraham revealed his genuine faith. And I'm going to give you three ways. Number one, he trusted in God's person. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried or tested, 
offered up Isaac. When he was tried, he offered up Isaac. Here we have the writer of Hebrews giving us a, if you would, a synopsis. He's not going into the details, but he is saying, hey, for those of you that are aware of Abraham, the Jews claimed him as their father. The Muslims claim him as their father. Christians today, we claim him as a spiritual father. I mean, when you look at this, every major religion out there looks at Abraham as their, 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 their forefather, if you would. And so what we see here is that uh, the writer of Hebrews is using this as an illustration to those Christians who are from a Jewish background or those who would be familiar with Abraham, knowing how important he was, and says, have you considered the faith of Abraham that took his son the one that he had a weight on from God, the one that he even doubted God and, and used his handmaid to try to help God out, that one that got to a point of absolute faith in God, when God finally delivered that son to him, and he was able to walk with that son and play with that son and teach that son. Some commentators say that uh, Isaac at this point in time of his life might have been in his late 20s, early 30s. Could have overpowered his hundred and something year old dad easily. There is so much in this that's illustrative of a future son who would come someday and lay down his life willingly. But yet we see here that Abraham had absolute trust in the person of God. You say, what do you mean by the person of God? I mean that God is the one that had a relationship with Abraham, did he not? Matter of fact, Isaiah and Chronicles, I believe it is, says that God considered Abraham a what? A friend. How cool is that? Can you imagine God calling you his friend? This demonstrates that God had quite the relationship with Abraham, and Abraham had quite the relationship with God, and yet for Abraham now to be at this point that he trusted in God's person so much that when God asked him to do something that you and I would just say, there's just no way. There's no way that I could even think it possible to offer up one of my kids. Now, if you ask my wife... So which one? Yeah. What? Let me look at the list of what they just did wrong this week. No, I'm, I'm joking. She wouldn't do that. But he got to the point where any one of us would be like, okay, is this a cult? Is this, is this kind of some kind of weird thing? You're... No, this was God talking to a friend who he has proven himself to, and Abraham at this point had proven himself to God, and God was using it as an illustration of a man who had to give up his only begotten son. I believe this is surely a slow progression of the promise that came from Adam and Eve that God would give them another seed. That seed would be one that would bruise the head of Satan. This is now many years later. We see now this same idea of a seed promise coming that there was going to be a son given when her womb was dead, incapable that would be delivered to them. Life came from death. But then now to offer up that son and God at the last moment saying, stop. I see that your heart would do what I asked you to do, but I prepared another sacrifice. Amazing story. I don't have time to go back. Read, read Genesis chapter 22 and understand when you, when you put these together, it's fascinating how God was working with a man that he knew trusted him but he was teaching two things. He was teaching us about the faith of Abraham, but he's also teaching us about a future promise. When we come now to the book of Hebrews, he had already explained that this was fulfilled in whom? Jesus Christ. He was that fulfilled promise. He was the one that came and died on that cross. He was the one that was buried, resurrected from the dead. All this was to demonstrate to us now as readers uh, many years later that we're looking back and here he uses it as an illustration in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament we see it as a reality that God did not use Isaac, but he used the seed of Isaac, Jesus Christ, to be that sacrifice. Remember, he's talking to people who are being converted from Judaism into Christianity and he's explaining to them why the law was not necessary, why the priests weren't necessary any longer, why the sacrificial system wasn't necessary any longer. And he said all this ties back to those who by faith alone trusted in the plan and the promise of God. And so what we see here is that Abraham had such a relationship with God that he trusted in God's person. He knew God was not just messing with him. He knew God was trustworthy. 
to the point where he knew that God could raise his son from the dead even if he slayed him right there. That's an amazing faith, folks. I don't care who you are. But that was the faith that was demonstrated based on their personal relationship that they had. He knew God wouldn't give a foolish command. He knew that God would provide another sacrifice. He knew that God had delivered him from three other desperate situations. Talk about the Pharaoh, Abimelech, and Chedorlaomer, uh, the other kings that were taken lot captive. He knew God would somehow keep his promise. What did that demonstrate? It demonstrated great trust in his God. This kind of trust only comes through time and testing of your relationship. For an illustration, Bonnie and I have been married 28 years. Do you know that I trust her more now than when we first got married? Why? Because of time and seeing each other in distant circumstances, being through a lot of trials together, watching her with our kids, her watching me with our kids, us interacting with many, many people, so many conversations, so many different types of things we've been through, fights, makeups, on and on and on. We trust each other so much more now because of time and testing and experience. Because we did it in a way that we thought was the right way to do it and, and praying together and saying our sorrows we need to and building that relationship. The same thing goes for your relationship with God. The more time you spend with God, the more testing He puts you through, the more trust you naturally have for Him as your God and as your deliverer, as one who desires good for you. So we see, first of all, the testing of Abraham revealed his genuine faith. He trusted in God's person. Secondly, he trusted in God's powers. Already made mention here in a sense, but look at chapter 11, verse number 19. Accounting that God was able to do what? Raise him up. He's talking about Isaac. He believed that even if he slew Isaac there on that altar, God had the power to raise him up. Now that's just absolute trust. I don't care who you are. That is absolute faith in this God's power. God took a man who was considered too old to produce a child. God took a woman whose womb was considered dead, according to the scriptures. God brought life from what was considered dead. God said that this son would be the heir of promises that were promised to Abraham. Think of that. And God said, go ahead and slay him. All this was now in the background of Abraham's heart and mind that if God promised me those things, I am in such a place where I so trust God that even if he asked me to kill my son, I believe God will raise him up. Or he's going to provide some other sacrifice here. He had that much trust in his God at that time. We can share Abraham's faith. You realize that? Not that he's going to ask you to offer up your child. But we can share his faith in a sense. Romans chapter 4, verse number 16. Notice what it says. Therefore, it, talking about the righteousness that comes by faith, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not that only which is of the law, but to the also that which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Here the Apostle Paul is writing a great dissertation in the book of Romans. He was saying it's not the law that brings righteousness. It's not your heritage that brings righteousness. It's not your good works that brings righteousness. None of that brings righteousness. But as Abraham was a man of faith in God's promises, you and I also can be considered Abraham's seed by trusting God's promise. His finished work of bringing forth the Messiah who died in our place for our sins. We also can have faith like Abraham had. And some, many of you already do. You've trusted in Christ as your Savior. Then lastly, I want you to notice, Abraham revealed his genuine faith by trusting in God's future plan. And I've made mention of this already, but just to reiterate, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, the latter portion, from whence also he received him in a what? In a figure. Do you know what that idea of a figure there is meaning? It means the word actually is parable. The fact that he asked Abraham to offer up his son Isaac, the writer of Hebrews now tells us this was a 
symbol or an illustration that God was using to point to something else that was coming someday. So here we have the writer of Hebrews clarifying for us, why did God put Abraham through this? It was all for a symbol for us who would come later on. It was for a symbol of those in the Old Testament who would come to Abraham after that. Can you imagine Isaac talking to people after that situation? You wonder, we don't know, did, did Abraham tell Sarah what was getting ready to happen? Can you imagine that story when they got back home? Remember he told the, the two uh, servants, stay here, we will be back. Was he lying or was he confident that God was going to raise up his son? According to the scriptures, he was confident God was going to bring his son back. But when he got back home, hey mom, hey uh, Sarah, so Isaac, how was your day with your dad? Well mom... <laughs> Dad, do I don't say anything till after dessert, okay? Well, let's have dessert first. What do you say? Come on, put yourself in these situations. I mean, this is just like... But Isaac had a story to tell. One of the stories might have been, my dad's a nut. But I think Isaac, knowing the promises and God speaking to him, Isaac said, you would not believe the faith that my father had. When Isaac got off that altar and saw God provide that ram in the thicket and understood, he already knew about the sacrificial system. There's no doubt many conversations that we're not privy to that went on because this is carried through the Old Testament even up to the writer of Hebrews who clarifies it for us. There's no doubt that Isaac had a strong faith in his father's God. And we see that in his own life. And so this idea of what does this testing about Abraham reveal about his genuine faith? He trusted in God's future plan. Look at what God let him in on. Abraham, the promise I gave you about your seed being multiplied and someday your seed will bring forth the Messiah? Isaac, let me tell you what God told me. Remember when I put you on that altar? Uh, Dad, yeah, that's a hard one to forget, Dad. Let me explain to you even more detail now so you understand. You've got to protect your lineage. You've got to understand what God has purposed for you. You, out of your loins someday, is going to come the Messiah. You must understand that. Be faithful to our God. And he was. And we go on and we go on down through the centuries till Jesus Christ comes. And we see a miraculous event how God brought forth this seed into this world in order to be the one who would die, but then didn't stay dead. He resurrected. And so we see that this future plan included the, the multitudes of seed, if you would, or offspring that would come to Abraham. We also see that it meant the messianic seed and the sacrifice that would come as well. If you turn back to Hebrews chapter number 1, just quickly as I conclude this message here in just a few moments, Hebrews chapter number 1, Notice what it says in verse number 1. If some of you have to remember far back when we started this series, God who at sundry times and in a diverse manner speak in time past unto the fathers by whom the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, His Son Jesus Christ, whom He hath appointed heir of all things by whom also He made the worlds. And now He goes into more description about Jesus Christ and the superiority of Jesus Christ compared to the law, compared to angels, compared to Moses, compared to everything else, the religious system. He said, Jesus Christ is superior to all that. That is why it is necessary for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus alone. Now in chapter 10, verse 19, through the end of uh, Hebrews, we see the practical outworking of this in our life. How does God want us to live based on this knowledge of the first 10 chapters where he describes Jesus Christ as superior to all the rituals and all the sacrificial system? Everything pointed to Jesus Christ. Now, in light of that, as Christians, how are we to live? We are to live by faith. Just like Abraham, just like Sarah, just like Abel, just like Enoch, just like we are to take their example and we are to live by faith in what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. The future plan to us is the past plan. The cross happened in our past. 
but still people in the future can come to the cross and trust Christ as their personal Savior. And the plan at the cross didn't stop there. There is a future still for all those who truly believe. It's a positive future. There's also a negative future for those who reject the gospel and reject Jesus Christ. And that's a horrible negative future for them. But we know also that God has got a plan for the nation of Israel to bring them back to himself and to restore them at some point in time in the future. Just as a point of reference to this last idea about this plan, a future plan, William Barclay is a known commentator of past years. He offers this very straightforward statement about Abraham's test of faith. If we want to see the story at its greatest, and if we want to see it as the writer to the Hebrews saw it, we must take it at its face value. It was a response of a man who was asked to offer his own son. Well, let's settle for a second. At face value, God asked a man to trust him to take his own son. But there's no man in his right mind unless he had an absolute faith in God's plan, his promise, that he would ever do that. But Abraham had that faith. The secondary point of that is there was a future to that promise. It was pointing to the day that Jesus Christ, of the seed of Isaac, of Jacob, of Abraham, would come someday and be the sacrifice for all man. Let me just read you 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of, the, uh, beforehand of the suffering of Christ and of the glory that should follow. Here the Old Testament prophets were, were seeking when is this event going to take place? When will the Messiah come? They were searching for that. And when it came, they weren't prepared. They were not ready to receive the Messiah. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Do you realize that God has equipped us with the blessing of faith in Jesus' finished work for you and even the angels are curious about what you're learning. And we treat God like it's so haphazard. We treat Him so flippantly. The prophets of the Old Testament looked forward to this day. The angels peer down like, what, when is it going to happen? What's going to take place? And you and I get to experience it. And yet sometimes we treat it as, eh, I could take it or leave it. So what's the application? What areas are you being tested today? Money, marriage, parenting, faith, stress, health, school, friendships, occupation, habitual sins. May I suggest to you that these tests reveal your true faith. How you handle it, how you deal with it, reveals who you really are in Christ. Have you come to the place in your life where you trust God first by obeying Him no matter the cost? Trusting God begins with knowing His Word. The Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Very clear, very simple. I would tell you, if you're not a person of faith, bathe yourself in the Word of God. Bathe your mind, your heart, listen to it, read it, hear it taught, keep listening. I guarantee you it will produce faith in your life. You just have to be willing. Trusting God's promises in spite of doubts is a demonstration of faith. You say, Pastor, do you ever doubt? Oh, yeah. Well, what do you do? I pray a lot and I keep moving forward. Why? Because it doesn't mean I have to understand everything God's doing, but I need to trust Him. I need to trust Him. He won't go against His word. I know that. So I just trust him as I march forward knowing that he's in charge. It's his work. It's not my work. It's not my life. It's his life. 
Trusting God in the small test prepares you for the future tests. High school students, what tests are you facing right now? They're preparing you for college tests. They're preparing you for life mate tests. They're preparing you for occupational tests. Military personnel, depending on what stage you're at, God's preparing you for the next test. Now listen, he may rewrite your whole schedule. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to trust him? We're constantly being put in a position of growing, learning, and sometimes being put in a test where we must come to trust God explicitly. Abraham demonstrated his faith in God by doing something that is not one of us, and I have five sons. I could not imagine, could not imagine being asked to do any of that. Abraham had great faith that God could raise up that child. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for illustrations like this that you give us that I believe with all my heart are true stories, historical accounts of how you interacted with mankind. And Abraham's test shows that he was a great man of faith, but also points forward to the cross, Jesus Christ, that he was one, a son who was given ultimately on the cross, but you did raise him from the dead. Thank you that Jesus did that to pay for my sins. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to be people of true faith, putting into practice what we say we believe. May you please be with each person here today who's going through different forms of testing. May they find their encouragement through your word and through times of prayer with you, or perhaps from others who have gone through similar tests and can encourage them. Help us to know how to reach out and encourage others. And then for those who don't have faith yet of their own, they would come to the point where they would trust you, Lord Jesus, explicitly for deliverance from their sin, knowing they could be forgiving and have a relationship with you starting today. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, just quickly, perhaps you're facing a test today and you would just say, with my uplifted hand, I just want you in general, Pastor, just pray for me in general. Are you going through a test today? You just raise your hand. Just say yes. Keep me in your prayers. I'm just I'm scanning the crowd. Just let me look real quick. God bless you. Many, many hands. God loves you. And he can do way more than I ever could. But I'll definitely try to remember the hands are raised. And I'll pray for you here in a moment. But perhaps you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I do not know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I've never trusted him. But that's a decision I know I need to make. I want to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. I want to trust Christ alone. I've never done that before. I want to trust Him as my Savior. God bless you. Anyone else? If you have questions about that, please, as soon as the service is over, you can see us in the hallway. We want to make sure that we can give you those answers. Allow me to pray for those who raise their hands. Father, thank you for those who raise their hands, indicating... They're going through some type of stress or testing right now. We know that you know their situation. There's no question that you do. Whether it's a self-induced test that they have got themselves into or something that there's no way they would have known, a health scare or somebody else did something and put them in a spot. We know that you can help them and give them the strength and answer them. So Lord, I ask for those in those situations. For those that these tests won't go away, it's going to be long term that you would give them the strength and the continued faith to trust you during those times. May you also encourage them to know that you're in charge. May you help them to rewrite their next step. Direct them in the way they should go. For those who are not sure of salvation, that you would help them to cling to Jesus alone. Trust you, Lord Jesus, for your deliverance. We thank you, we praise you for your goodness. It is in Jesus' name I pray.